Welcome to our Good Friday service. We're going to begin by turning to Psalter number 47. We have a versification of Psalm 22. My God, my God, I cry to thee, O why hast thou forsaken me? We'll sing stanzas 1, 3, 4, 8, and 9. 1, 3, 4, 8, and 9 of number 47. going to read this evening from John 19. We turn to John chapter 19, where we'll read the first 24 verses of the chapter. We hear God's word from John 19. Then Pilate, therefore, took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold, the man! When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate, therefore, heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king 
speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him, therefore unto them, to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. We read God's word that far. We're going to turn again to our Psalters, this time to number 184. 184, a versification of Psalm 69. We'll sing the first three, one, two, three, and then six and seven. One, two, three, and six and seven of 184. Let's turn to God in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, we count it a privilege to gather in order to commemorate 
the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we spend time in meditation upon His crucifixion and upon His suffering and upon His death, as we recount the horror of those events that occurred on Golgotha, we are humbled. We know that His suffering was for us and on our behalf. His suffering was because of our sins and because of our sinfulness. And as we gather in the consciousness of that deep guilt and shame, we are brought to see the marvelous wonder of Thy love, Thy faithfulness, and Thy grace. That Thou art pleased to give unto Thy church and to Thy saints a Savior, one who came and walked among us, who was willing to take upon himself the full burden of the wrath that we deserve and bore it on Calvary so that we would not die and suffer in hell, but so that we would live everlastingly with thee. Lord, we are humbled as we consider what wondrous works he performed for us. And as we consider the horror and the shame and the sorrow that He endured, we are touched. Some of us that have had to deal with death alone, the struggles and the difficulties of dealing with the loss of an unborn child, dealing with the situation of death and no one around to comfort us or to assist us, having to suffer alone. And now, in this situation in which Thou hast placed us, some of us have had the difficult situation of having loved ones die and not being able to enjoy the comfort of a hug or the comfort of interaction with others not being able to say goodbye even as we would have desired, burdened because of those who face the end of their life without having that interaction with family and with friends, but are alone. But as we think upon our own suffering and our own situation, that of our loved ones, we realize that what we experience cannot even begin to compare to what our Lord endured. He suffered alone. He died alone. There were no men, no women to comfort Him and to encourage Him. They forsook Him and fled. And yet we know that He was not alone. Thy hand was with Him. Thou didst given Him Thy Spirit Angels were present in order to uphold Him and to assist Him. And Lord, we're thankful for that confession also as we walk through the, stri the trials and sufferings of this life. Thankful for Thy care for Thy children. That even when it seems as though we are alone, even when it seems as though there is nothing around us that can serve as our comfort and our encouragement, no one who cares... Thou art with us, and Thou art the one sustaining and giving us strength by Thy Word and by Thy Spirit. Thou dost even employ the angelic realm as ministering spirits on Thy behalf to care for and to preserve Thy church. And we thank Thee for that blessed assurance that by faith we believe that we have Christ and we have His Spirit and that we are able to press on knowing and believing that Thou art with us. Thou art keeping us and preserving us, and Thou art the one giving us strength day by day. As we experience limitations due to the coronavirus, and as we yet live under the restrictions that have been imposed upon us, continue, Lord, to be with Thy saints. Watch over Thy children as we're kept from gathering publicly, as we worship from our homes, and as we're privileged to be able to hear Thy Word and to be edified by it. We pray, Lord, that Thou wilt grant unto us what we stand in need of. Be near to those that are elderly, 
Grant them grace and strength that they might be kept in the palm of thy hand. Be near unto those who are inclined towards sin and temptation. Keep them from the evil one. And grant them the grace that they stand in need of in order to resist and to maintain that way of thankful obedience. Being away from thy house, it's easy for us to become lazy and to not give attendance as we ought to thy word. Forgive us, Lord, and rather use this experience as a means to humble us, that we might see our need for thy word, our need for worship, that we might see the need for thy grace, and that we might be taught also to see how weak we are in our great need for thy forgiveness and for the cross of Jesus Christ. We are proud. We are inclined to be self-dependent. We think that we can stand and we think that we can ordain and plan out the events of our lives. But how foolish we are, as in a moment thou art able to bring our best laid plans to nothing. And thou dost remind us that thou art the one in control of all things. And thou art the one working all things according to thy perfect counsel and plan in anticipation of our spiritual good. We thank thee for the gospel. We thank Thee for the glorious message of salvation in Jesus Christ. And we thank Thee for the hope that is ours in knowing and believing that though we are proud sinners, inclined to go our own way and to pursue our own sinful paths, our own lusts and pleasures, Thou hast given unto us a Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Thou hast worked in our hearts humility. Thou hast brought us to our knees in confession of our sins. And thou dost give unto us to see that our sins, though they be great and many, have been forgiven. And that our sinful natures, against which we do battle every day, have also been overcome through the blood of the cross. And that we are able to know and believe that death is the means by which thou wilt free us from that sinful nature, and bring us into the joy and the bliss that awaits. Forgive us, Lord, and strengthen us, and grant that we might ever be thankful for the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May our hearts thrill as we consider and as we think upon the wonder of His works and the great love with which He loved us. And Lord, we pray thy blessing upon thy word. As that word is set forth, may it be a means by which we might be comforted and strengthened in our circumstance and situation, by which we might be reminded of the great and wondrous love that our Heavenly Father has for us, his creatures here below. And may we set our heart then on the things that are spiritual, the things that are everlasting. As we commemorate the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we do not mourn for him but we mourn over our sins and our sinfulness. We cry out for mercy, and we pray, Lord, that Thou wilt grant unto us, by faith, the forgiveness of our sins and the joy of life everlasting. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We turn to John 19, verses 23 and 24. For our, the text of our message this evening. We read in John 19, verses 23 and 24, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. We read God's word that far. The reproach that Jesus faced continued after he left the Sanhedrin. Jesus is brought to the judgment hall of Pilate, where the reproach would continue for God's sake. Now the Sanhedrin had gathered in the dark of the night in order to condemn Jesus to death. They found him guilty, but they knew that they were not able to execute the death penalty. 
And for that reason, therefore, they had to get the Roman leaders involved. And so now they bring Jesus before Pilate, all ordained by God in his perfect counsel as the means by which God's Son would be set before a worldly judge who would determine then what the world would think concerning the Messiah. What would the world say concerning Jesus? It was the morning of Jesus' crucifixion, Friday morning, early, now that he's brought before Pilate. Now, the trial before Pilate is very peculiar. First of all, it must have been relatively brief. Secondly, we have here Pilate declaring this so-called condemned prisoner innocent. And thirdly, we have Pilate trying to find every reason why not to deal with this one. First of all, he tries to send him to Herod. Secondly, he tries to release him in the place of Barabbas. And when those efforts fail, he finally washes his hands, claiming innocence with regard to this one. Now, immediately after the crowds choose Barabbas, Jesus is scourged. It was the cruel custom of the Romans that they would take a prisoner who was condemned to be crucified, and they would first scourge him. They would tie his hands, they would tie him to a pole, and they would take leather thongs that had lead on the tips with which they would rake his back. Now they do that to Jesus before Jesus even has been condemned to death. They then bring him to Calvary. He carries the cross part way. Simon carries it the rest of the way. And once they get to Calvary, the soldiers then nail him to the cross. They place the cross erect in the ground and they strip him of all of his clothes. They strip him and they subject him further to mockery and to reproach. This was a time when the soldiers now stepped back and enjoyed some entertainment at the expense of the prisoners. There was the physical aspect of his suffering, but the insulting nature of his mockery and taking pleasure in his reproach is now on the foreground here in verses 23 and 24. This history is the revelation of God concerning the Messiah. And every detail we know is divinely ordained, it's divinely recorded, so that the doctrine of our salvation might be more fully known. The text points out this history is not just a mere recording of facts. What's taking place here is part of God's divine plan to fulfill Scripture. It must needs be that the soldiers take Jesus' clothes. Now you know that that's contrary to every artistic description of the cross, as well as to every blasphemous movie. They all cover Jesus. They ignore this passage. These things we read, the soldiers did. Verse 24. And so we look at this passage under the theme, Jesus stripped. Noting, first of all, the reproach. Secondly, the fulfillment of Scripture. And finally, our salvation. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments. Now the words of Psalm 22 in verse 18 are quoted here. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. That's what we just sang from Psalter number 47. The words of Psalm 22 are quoted as a complaint of David not only, but they demonstrate a shadow of the one who was to come. That that was pointing to the Messiah. And Jesus now is fulfilling Scripture. The prophecy was, and it had to be understood, as that which reveals the promise of the Gospel concerning salvation in Jesus Christ. Now here's the question that the early church faced, and it's a question that we face. How do we know that Jesus is the Messiah? And the answer is, we look at the Old Testament. And God works faith in us to believe that the prophecies of the Old Testament were pointing to Jesus. 
so that we read in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, verse 2. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. We read in Isaiah 7, verse 14, that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. God makes clear that Jesus is born of a virgin. But not only does the Old Testament prophecy lay out all the various aspects of Jesus' life, it also sets forth the offices that he would occupy, priest and king. It also sets forth his suffering and his death. And that the Jews overlooked. The Jews wanted an earthly savior, one who would deliver and save them. And therefore, as they looked at the Old Testament, they didn't see the references to the Messiah and his suffering and his death. That became a stumbling block for the Jews. How could Jesus be the Messiah if he suffered and he died? The Messiah, in their estimation, was supposed to be a great leader who would conquer all the powers of the Romans and would usher in a new glorious reign under his own rule. The apostles, therefore, made that their theme. And throughout the missionary journeys, which we were just starting in catechism, Paul made repeatedly that his theme, that Jesus was the promised Messiah. And that the promised Messiah, spoken of in the Old Testament, had to suffer and die. So that when Paul comes to Thessalonica and he preaches there for three weeks, he preaches the suffering that Jesus endured. Not merely by chance, but as a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. It wasn't just a suffering at the hands of some wicked men. The reproach that Jesus endured fulfilled prophecy. And that suffering directs us to the fact that this Jesus then is indeed the promised Messiah of whom the Old Testament spoke. The word of the gospel and the word of the promise was that the Messiah would suffer and that he would die an accursed death on the cross. And that makes the suffering and it makes the cross God's. This was God's doing. This wasn't just the work of wicked men. Jehovah God is sovereign. And even though the enemy takes him and with wicked hands crucifies him, our Lord Jesus Christ goes the way that was ordained by his heavenly Father. The way that was according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. As Acts 2 verse 23 pointed out in Peter's sermon. Now there's a word of God then in each fulfillment of prophecy regarding Jesus' death. Just to read this quickly and to think this incident of taking his clothes away was not so important would be a mistake. This adds to the shame and the suffering that Jesus endured. The fact of Jesus' garments being removed is recorded in all four of the gospel narratives. All the details are significant, and they show to us something important regarding our salvation. The account of John here is the most detailed. It sets forth the fact that there were four soldiers, that they, th they took all of Jesus' possessions and divided them four ways, and then it adds the fact that there was that coat without seam. They didn't want to rip it. And therefore, after they had divided all of Jesus' clothes and material possessions four ways, they determined then that they would cast lots over who would get his inner garment. They parted my raiments among them, and for my vestures they did cast lots. Psalm 22, verse 18, and verse 24. They took Jesus' clothes. Now it appears to have been the custom that the soldiers would strip the victim before they nailed him to the cross. It was a custom that they would then take the privilege of dividing those last belongings among themselves. There would be the head cloth, there would have been his sandals, there would be his outer coat, his girdle, and then there was that robe, which would have been the garment closest to his skin, seamlessly woven by either his mother or one of the other women who loved him. 
What took place at the foot of the cross then? Jesus carried the cross, as you well know. Simon took over when Jesus could no longer carry it. And once they got to Calvary, they then nailed, took Jesus' clothes off, nailed him to the cross, and then they placed him upright before earth, in the earth. And then they divided things into piles, cast lots to determine who would get what. This belongs to the shameful reproach and the mockery that Jesus endured. The cross was shameful. Taking away his clothes was deepest humiliation. Nothing remained now but to die. And his body now is exposed to everyone to see. Now one's clothes are intended to be a covering for the shame of sin. You know that that wasn't the case before the fall. Adam and Eve didn't need clothing. There was no sin. There had been no shame. And therefore, Adam and Eve, without clothing, experienced bliss and fellowship and communion with God. But after the fall, because of the effects of the fall and sin and lust and shame, there was a need for covering. Our bodies became instruments of lust. Our clothing then serves as a covering for that sin and for that shame. Now, we live in a day when modern fashions increasingly deny that. They expose more and more of that shame. But the child of God understands and recognizes, on the one hand, within the realm of marriage, the beauty of the human body. But also the necessity then, when in public, to cover that body in order that it not become an occasion for the lust of the eye. That was true of Jesus as well. He covered his body as he was publicly making himself known throughout Judea and Samaria and Galilee. He had garments that covered him from head to toe. And as such then, in the midst of a sinful world, Jesus went around clothed. Now at the cross, he is stripped and he's exposed to the world. And this becomes an occasion then of shame, suffering. He's made a public spectacle. And he's not given so much as a loincloth, but he becomes now a spectacle of lust to a sin-cursed world. He hangs, exposed to all to see. This is the final shame to which Jesus is subject. They took his clothes. Now one's clothes are one's final possessions. One who has no clothing has nothing left. He's destitute. Sometimes we talk about the fact that someone escaped a fire or they escaped a tornado with just the clothes on their back. That's all they had. But at least they had that. They still had their clothes. Not Jesus. He's cast out. His last possessions are taken from him. Even among sinful men, the bodies retain their clothing and are even buried with clothes on, but not with regard to our Savior. They divide his clothes up. Now what is the message that's sent here? First of all, you won't need them anymore. Your life here on earth is done. You are now going to die. Before his very eyes, his last possessions are divvied up, lots are cast, and the soldiers walk away with his clothes. Deep mockery, cruel insults become his experience. The reproaches of them that reproached me are fallen upon me. This was the spoiling of the Messiah. Overcome by his enemies, the object of public humiliation. There was no place for the Messiah in the world. Jesus is rejected by the world. There never was a place for him, as you well know. When he came into the world, in the deepest sense of the wickedness of men, men rejected him, they despised him. There was no place for him in the inn. But when he was born, he was wrapped with swaddling clothes. 
At least he had those swaddling clothes and a manger when a baby. Later he would testify, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. At least he had his robe and he had his outer coat. Now he's stripped. There's no place for him in the world. His last possessions are taken from him and divided up before his eyes. And sport is made of it. Mockery, ridicule, and shame. And that mockery reveals the emptiness of the world. They sat. They watched him. Crowds gathered to gawk at him. And Jesus hangs, helpless, exposed to the world. What is the significance here? First of all, this was fulfillment of prophecy. The four soldiers were fulfilling the word of God. Now, they didn't realize that. It's true that this is how the Romans did things. But we know there's more to it. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. They were not aware of that prophecy. They likely were not intentionally doing so. But God rules at Golgotha, not men. And the Lord God is controlling the events that are taking place here for the purpose of His own glory. Why was it necessary for Jesus and for our salvation that the soldiers take from Him His clothes? First of all, it was necessary for Christ. At the cross, Jesus reveals himself as servant. He was the king, but now he appears as servant. And he's stripped for the arduous task of earning salvation for the people of God. Stripped of his clothes so that he might fully enter into their misery that included their shame. He was stripped as a servant so that he could love God and willingly give his life for the sake of of those whom the Father had given him. And Jesus willingly gave of himself, even his clothes and his life, for the sake of our salvation. But this was necessary for us, and it was necessary for our salvation. Sinners do not deserve to hang with their clothes. Sinners are guilty of Adam's sin and the sins that they've committed. Rome intended that the crucifixion be humbling. God intended that humiliation for the sake of the guilt and the shame of sin. The justice of God towards sinners is what Jesus had to endure. Nakedness is always a symbol of being exposed before God with no means to cover oneself. As we stand before the living God in our sin, there is no covering. We stand exposed. We cannot hide behind our own works. We cannot hide behind anything. We stand before Jehovah God, and God, as the searcher of our hearts, lays us bare. He exposes everything that is within us. There's no righteousness to be found within us. And the punishment of God is to strip the sinner and to lay him bare to open shame. That will be the experience of the wicked on Judgment Day. God will lay them bare, exposing all of their sin, all their unrighteousness. And there won't be any hiding possible. Not even hiding behind their clothing. The sinner stands exposed before God. Now the sinner tries to exalt himself. The sinner tries to bring God's justice down. But God demonstrates His justice by stripping the sinner and bringing the sinner down to shame. Nakedness sums up the sinner's condition before Almighty God. Note this, the shameless are those who appear in public without clothes. Part of the expression of man's rebellion against God is that man walks around glorying in his shame, glorying in his or her nakedness, exposing their secret parts for everyone to stare at. They will not cover their nakedness. They believe that they can be exposed before God and stand. But they cannot. 
Jehovah God, as a just God, will expose them and will cause them to see the judgment that they deserve before Him. Now there's also a priestly aspect tied to this clothing. When God clothed Adam and Eve, He gave them the clothing of animals. There was an important picture in that clothing. God unclothed an innocent animal. He shed the blood of that animal, whether it was a lamb or something else, in order that man and woman might be covered from the guilt and the shame of their sin. Blood was shed for a covering from sin. And that event pointed to the coming of the Messiah, who would be uncovered, whose blood would be shed, who would be exposed for the sake of the covering of His people. The most important robe that Jesus wore was not that seamless robe that was taken from Him. It was another robe. A robe that He would earn. A robe of perfect righteousness for the sake of His people. Jesus stood as the priest of His people. He who came to stand in the nakedness of our sin and shame before God He who knew no sin became sin for us. And He died so that Scripture might be fulfilled. And He subjected Himself to that shame and He willingly endured it so that He might earn for us the garment of righteousness. He was stripped. He died in order that we might wear His garments and be clothed with His robe of righteousness. There's a glorious prophecy in this word of salvation, in this deepest of reproaches. He who was stripped and placed on a tree receives another robe. The soldiers take from Him His last earthly possessions and they gamble over them. But of those earthly garments, He would have no need again. For it was through His blood, the blood of atonement, at the head of His brethren, that He would merit the garment for all of His brethren, His own righteousness. And we see that as our salvation. We stand before Jehovah God with nothing that we can bring, nothing that we can present before the living God of heaven and earth. There's only sin, there's shame, there's guilt. And the shame of our sin weighs on us like a heavy blanket. Sometimes it threatens to smother us. As we think about our sin, and we think about what we are guilty of, and we think of the things that we've thought about, so much awareness there is of our unworthiness, so much shame and guilt, that it can be debilitating. It threatens to bring us down to destruction. What would happen if those around me would know these things about me. If they would know the thoughts that I think. If they would know the things that I did. There's a shame by which I realize that my life would be brought to an end as I know it if these things were exposed to my family or my friends. That shame and that guilt can bring us down and nigh near destroys us. The public shame of that sin The child of God commits a sin. That sin becomes public. And now everyone knows about it. And that one just wants to bury his face, wants to put an end to his life in order that he can have somehow a new start. We want to run and flee away from that shame. Jesus Christ gave up His clothes in order that He might clothe us with His perfect righteousness. And He represents all of His elect children, and He earned for them a glorious covering. Jesus delivers you from the shame and the guilt of your sin. We don't weep for Christ this evening. We rejoice in the wonder of grace by which the shame and the guilt of our sin is removed. And the cross was deliverance from all of the various aspects of sin. The reproach, the shame, the guilt, all removed. The word of the cross is this. They took His clothes and they put Him to open shame so that you who confess Christ 
might never be put to shame. He was despised. He was shamed for you and for me. Oh, the devil tries. The devil tries to bring our sins to our mind. And the devil tries to shame us. But by faith, we cling to the wonder of the cross. The Son of God willed that He would deliver you and I from the shame of sin. And through the cross, He takes us shameful sinners who have no right to stand in the presence of God. And He brings us into God's presence. The repentant malefactor, shamed because of his sin, is brought into the presence of the Almighty God, the righteous God of heaven and earth. His sins forgiven, enjoying communion with Jehovah God. And even though we would blush and we would turn away from the brilliance of the glory of the Almighty God, Jehovah God takes us into His presence. He assures us our sins have been forgiven. And He gives us to enjoy fellowship and communion with Him now and to all eternity. And on Judgment Day, yes, our sins will be exposed as we too will face judgment But the verdict will be our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ intervening, clothing us with His righteousness so that we will not stand alone and unclothed, but we will be declared righteous in Christ. Every one of your sins cast away, forgotten, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. This promise God gave in the beginning after the fall. God covering that shame by the shedding of blood. And that wonder realized on Calvary. By faith we lay hold on the righteousness that is ours in Jesus Christ. By faith we take our place with the soldiers at the foot of the cross. We stand. Not as they stood, we stand with the confession, though I am naked before God in the guilt and the shame of my sin, though I have no robe of my own, I lay hold on the cross. I lay hold on Christ and His righteousness. I have a Savior who bore the reproach of my sin, who took upon Himself my shame and my guilt in order that He might clothe me with His perfect righteousness and give me to know the wonder of forgiveness through His atoning blood. I am able to come into the presence of the living God without shame. And I am able to enjoy fellowship and communion with God. I am able to be exalted in Him. His shame is my joy and my exaltation. And so the saints, in the book of Revelation, as they're found in the New Jerusalem, are wearing robes of linen. Not literally, of course, because we won't need clothing anymore in heaven where there will be no more sin and no more shame, no more guilt. But those long white robes, symbolic of the perfect righteousness, the spotless holiness, and of the complete victory that is ours in Christ. And they are ours by faith. They belong to you and to me, to all of those who believe in Jesus. He allowed Himself to be stripped in complete obedience in order that through His death He might clothe us with that clothing far better than fig leaves, that clothing far better than coats of skin, His perfect righteousness. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank Thee for the shame that our Lord endured on our behalf. And we thank Thee for the glorious and wondrous covering that is ours in Him. We who stand before Thee naked in our shame and sin have been given to know the righteousness in Jesus Christ. And by faith we lay hold on that wonder and we look to Thee as our heavenly Father who loves us for Christ's sake. Amen. We turn to Psalter number 304.
Psalter number 304, The Marvelous Works of God. We're going to sing the first three and then the sixth. One, two, three, and six of 304. Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we pray that thou wilt grant unto us grace and peace from him which is and was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.